Genesis chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. And we're continuing our study and our look through the book of Genesis. Last week we saw that there was wickedness and there was not just any type of wickedness. It was just this rampant, uncontrolled, just hellish wickedness of man. And then it was intensified by the fact that literal fallen demons or angels were procreating with other or with human beings, with human women, and creating this hybrid demon spawn that, that just was an absolute uh, just abomination in the sight of God. And so uh, to say that things were going poorly is an understatement. So this, this, the intentions of men's hearts were just absolutely corrupt at all points in time. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 6 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of their thoughts and of his hearts were only evil continually. So even the intentions, even the, the, not just the things that they were saying and doing, but the intentions of their thought processes were evil. The things that they were thinking up and not even maybe saying they were evil. All of it was just evil hellish and evil and then verse 6 tells us that that the lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart so the lord said i will blot out man whom i have created from the face of the land man and animal and creeping things and birds of the heavens i am sorry that i made them wow so it, it saddens God's heart when sin is rampant. God was saddened by the state of humanity. And it grieved him to the point where he, had just, he was sad that he had even created them. But in the midst of all of this hellishness and all of this just rampant wickedness, there's a glimmer of hope. There's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We see Noah. And Noah found favor with God. Verse 8 says that, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous and a blameless man in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Noah was a man who defied the odds. He was the guy that was the odd man out. He was the anomaly of his generation. He was the guy that when everything was going one certain way, he was going the complete opposite. He defied the odds. He walked with God. He was righteous. He was blameless. And in a generation that sees rampant wickedness like ours, we need more Noah's. We need more men and women who stand firm on the word of God and say, we will not cave to the evil and the wickedness of our day. We will stand for righteousness. So that was the calling from last week. In the midst of wickedness, we need to walk with God. This week, we're going to see in the text that God gives us a little bit more insight and goes a little bit deeper into what's going on in this generation. Last week we see that the intentions of his heart are evil. He's just constantly thinking wickedness. This week, um, not only are their intentions um, bad, but they're engrossed in sexual immorality. Not just that, they're also violent. They look to destroy and murder and kill each other. Man, does that sound familiar do we does it sound like 2024 yeah it sure does human beings are bloodthirsty human beings like listen it is a wild thing most of us can't be in a room with each other for more than six hours and we want to do like oh listen i want to just hurt you like people just we have this the sin nature that every one of us are burdened with we want, to, we want to add each other's throats. This is the reason the Holy Spirit must be in charge. Human beings have this bloodthirstiness. Let's look at verse 11 in chapter 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. 
For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end to all flesh. The earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them. I will destroy them with the earth. So, this is God's remedy. God has a remedy to the problem. He has a way to fix the evil of the day. It is to destroy mankind. God sees the amount of evil that's around, and He says, I am going to wipe them off the planet. Now, this doesn't mean that he's going to destroy everything in the world. He doesn't, like, indeed, not, not the earth itself. The earth is still there. He's going to what? He's going to destroy humanity. The level of wickedness warrants divine judgment. How do we know that he didn't destroy the earth? We're still on it. We're, now, did stuff shift? Did stuff, stuff change? Did continents break up? You bet. Absolutely. Was there, was there a shift? Was there a change? You bet. But it's still the earth. It's still the Lord's. So, the level of wickedness warrants divine judgment from God himself against humanity. And listen, God has every right to do what he wants because he's God. If God wants to this morning, if he had wanted to this morning, send an asteroid and just obliterate the, like, just everything in the universe... He could do that because he's the author. He's the one who made it. He's the creator of it. Uh, um, anyone that creates something, if I build something, how many of you guys have ever built something, put something together, and you're like, man, I just don't like that, and you just tear it apart and start again? Anybody done that? Okay. God has the same right. He built it. He put it together. He fashioned it. If he wants to destroy it, he can. And he had, a, he had every right to do this in the day of Noah. That he hasn't done it in 2024 is a testimony that he cares for us and he wants to see men and women repent and trust in the gospel. You've got another day of mercy. You've got another week of God being kind. Don't presume upon it. Rush into the person and work of Christ. But like I said, there's a ray of hope in the midst of all of this. In the midst of all the chaos, there's this bright light of hope. God creates a way for Noah and his family to be saved. They were were not going to be destroyed with the rest of humanity. Why? Because God saw the righteousness and the godliness of Noah and that Noah walked with him and he said, that's mine and you will be spared wrath. I want you to understand... Christians are never going to be spared tribulation. There is always going to be tribulation on this side of the grave. But what we will be spared is wrath. A son or daughter of Jesus Christ will never experience the wrath of God. Now, are we going to experience tribulation? You better believe it. Ask the Christians in Iran. Ask the Christians in Canada. And if we're not careful, ask the Christians in America. It's coming. Buckle up. But Noah is not going to be destroyed with the rest of humanity. He was going to be rescued. And we as human beings follow and trust. When we trust God's plan for salvation, there's always a path for us to walk. There's always a way for us to escape judgment. We have what's called divine protection. That's, Noah had divine protection. And here, God gives him a way to, to, to get to that divine protection in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, this was more than likely uh, the gopher wood in that day was probably what he was talking about. There was the abundance of cedar and cypress trees that are in that area. So there was an abundance of those. So he says, use that. And... That's, that was what he does. Verse 15, he gives the dimensions. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is going to be 300 cubits. And the breadth is going to be 50 cubits. And the height is going to be 30 cubits. Make a roof for it. Finish it to, the, to a cubit above. Set the door of the ark in its side. Make with it lower and second and third decks. 
For behold, I will bring a flood of water upon the earth and destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So he gives the dimensions. And and I've been to the ark, which is in Kentucky right now. They've replicated that. Ken Ham has replicated that thing. And I'm telling you, I cannot describe... How many of you guys have... Have you... Anybody in there? You've been there? You can't describe the, the... When you see it, it's just... You can't... Even... There's nothing in this Kentucky town. Like, it's just an empty field. And all of a sudden, you pop over the top, and it's just this ginormous structure that is just stunning. And you go through... You get to go through all three levels of the decks, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And to see the intricacies of... And, and listen, they built that thing with modern day tractors and all the, all the cranes and all that stuff. No, Noah didn't have that. He had God's instruction plan and God's protection and provision. And him and his sons worked. And they built it. 120 years. 120 years to build this thing. And this was... Now, when you start to think about this, because people think, of, oh, he's built this boat. It's a pleasure cruise. It, when, you think of, when you think of a boat, oftentimes we think of like the carnival cruise ships or, or uh, you know, yachts and things like that. This thing was not a cruise ship. It had a job. This thing was to keep Noah and his family and the animals alive and safe from the coming flood. John MacArthur states that the ark was not designed as a typical ship, but rather a massive, stable structure meant to float and preserve life through the flood. The repl- like I said, the, rep- the replica in uh, Kentucky is just stunning. And I, I would encourage everyone that hears this, go make time to go see it. It's, I don't know, 10 hours away. Plan a vacation. It, it's worth, you, you're going to fill up at least half a week. There's a lot there. There's a lot going on. Um, it's, it's pretty stunning. Let's look at verse 18. Let's keep going. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, and every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you, and keep, and you will keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them, the animals. And Noah did as he was commanded by God. Woo! I was reading through a commentary by C.H. Spurgeon on this particular text. And C.H. Spurgeon offers a profound insight in Genesis 6.18. Focusing on the covenant that God establishes with Noah. Spurgeon highlights the significance of this divine covenant. So back up in verse 18 where it says, I will establish a covenant with you. A covenant is an agreement with Noah. And so God establishes this covenant with Noah. And Spurgeon highlights the significance of this divine covenant, emphasizing God's faithfulness and grace in promising to preserve Noah and his family amidst the impending flood. Spurgeon interprets this covenant as a, as a testament of God's unwavering commitment to his people. And this is where I want us to go in this. Noah's covenant was a broader theme of salvation in the modern day Christian theology that we have. The ark is a picture and a type. It's a picture and a type. God provided an ark for Noah and his family. He provides a way of salvation through the ark. He does the same in Christ. 
He does the exact same thing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He provides a way of salvation for all those who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the midst of the chaos and the carnage, God provides an ark of safety for Noah and his family. And and today, in the midst of all the wickedness, listen, there is no shortage of wickedness in the day in which we live. Amen? There is no shortage of evilness in this day and time. And when we see this, the, the, in the midst of all this, God provides an ark of safety for Noah and his family in the midst of this wickedness. But in the midst of all the immorality, God offers an, offer, an ark of safety in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ for those who would believe and trust in Him. There will Listen, there will be a day of judgment for humanity. It's known and the scripture calls it, this is the second death. And those who are in the ark of Christ will have nothing to fear. But those that are outside of the ark will experience a flood of judgment. And there may be a day and time today where men and women mock what you do. Mock what you believe. Mock what you say. But there will be a day that that mocking will cease. Oh, they mocked Noah. He was the town lunatic what is rain? They'd never seen rain before. Rain? What is flood? What? Why are you building a boat in the middle of a field? There's no body of water. Why are you building a boat? Moron. What are you doing? He preached and built. Preached and built. Pled with men and women to see the ark of safety. The, the offer was there. Listen, judgment's coming. Get in the ark. Get in the ark. But they didn't. They mocked. This story of Noah and the ark, is, it has relevance in today's culture, in today's world. The only ark of safety in this day and age from the impending judgment is Christ. That's it. Chapter 7 kicks off with... with um, Everything's been completed. Noah is gathered the, the, the ark. It's been built. He's put all these things in. And when everything was ready, chapter 7, verse 1, when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark with all of your family, for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. There was no other pe- there was like there was nobody else. There was no one else. And here's the mistake that we make in ministry in 2024. And listen, here, I need you to hear me on both sides of this. I am not anti I'm not an anti numbers guy. Man, I'd love to see the rafters filled to this place. I'd love to see hundreds and hundreds of people come to know Christ. But I'm telling you we have put way too much emphasis on the numbers and far less emphasis on the discipleship of who we have in front of us. Noah and his family were spared. What a testimony of ministry Noah had. His family was saved. You know how many ministers are running the world why their families are going to hell? You know how many pastors? I grew up as a pastor's kid. My dad was the anomaly pastor. Because there were so many ministers who were so focused on ministering to the church that they ignored their children. And their kids. That's the reason there's a stigmatism to a PK, preacher's kid. Now, all your preacher's kid. You know, you're a normal preacher's kid, you're a different kind of preacher's kid. Because preacher's kids typically are the worst. And that's only because they hang out with the deacons' kids. But uh, <laughs> I gotta stick to the notes. But this is the reality: is that there's so many people that ignore their families. You are called by God to minister to your family first. My priority is my chil- my wife, and my children, and then everything else comes after them because. If I, the scripture says, if I don't take care of them, I'm worse than an infidel. I'm worse than an unbeliever. You have a pagan behind the pulpit. 
if I don't take care of my kids and my wife. So we might look at Noah and go, oh, look, man, Noah didn't have very many converts. Didn't have very many people get saved. No, nope. but man, nobody says Noah was a failure. Right. Noah succeeded in exactly what God told him to do. What did God tell him to do? Go into the ark with your family. For among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Noah goes in and takes his family and all the animals that God told him to take in. And listen, this is a side note too. I don't have this in my notes. Um, I I believe that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. There is is evidence for that. If you need to see, uh, there's plenty of documentaries on that. What we're being taught and what kids are being taught in school today is that the earth is billions and billions of years old. No, it's not. The oldest tree in the world is about 4,800 years old. Why? Because about 4,800 years ago, there was a flood. There was a flood. Worldwide, global destruction. And that's about how old the world is. It's about 6,000 years old. It was 6,500 years old. Somewhere, give give or take, a couple hundred years. God created everything within a seven-day time frame. Or a six-day time frame. And on the seventh day, he rested and, and what Satan is trying to interject into the public education system is that it was billions and billions of years ago there was stardust and a period on the, that's smaller than the dot of the page of this page, on this, on this uh, book. It combusted and exploded. And everything showed up. What? Where is that? No. People say, well, that's science, Caleb. You might believe the Bible, but I believe science. I'm like, well, okay, you can trust in your dot. I'll trust in my God. Uh, You trust in your dot, but but you have to start asking questions. Where'd the dot come from? What caused the dot to explode? If you believe these things. Listen, I believe in a big bang. It's coming. It hasn't come yet, but it's coming. God's going to show up and it's going to be a big bang. There's going to be judgment, and it's going to be wild. But those that are in Christ, Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So, uh, along with that, I also believe in that 6,000 years, I, this is, you know, you can say your preacher's crazy. I also believe that dinosaurs were on the ark. So does Ken Ham. There's actually replicas of those dinosaurs on the ark. You say, well, wait a minute, Caleb. If there were dinosaurs on the ark... This is not in my notes, I'm sorry. This is just me shooting from the hip. If there were dinosaurs in the ark, how come we don't see any? Well, shoot, do you not remember all the stories of dragons being slayed by people in the dark ages? Listen, we like to hunt. Amen, fellas? Okay? You want to go, let's go hunt them. Listen, let's go take a moose down. Let's take a bear down. You give a man a challenge and a gun. Listen, I got it. I'll go get him. Listen. I don't know if, if, if dinosaur hamburgers were good, but maybe. Maybe. You ever had a moose burger? They're really good. Elk's a little gamey. But they're all throughout the text. Job talks about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If it's in the Bible, God created dinosaurs. You say, well, how do they get them in the ark? If they're a dinosaur, you get a baby one. Just make sure one's pink and one's blue. <laughs> and you'll be, you'll be good. <laughs> you'll be good. Sorry, go back to my notes. So he gets onto the ark. And verse 16, And those that entered in, male and female, if you didn't get the pink and blue, there it is. Verse 16. Male and female. I know, because we live in a world, okay? We've got to talk about it. People, oh, there's there's more than two genders. Oh, no, there's not. Male and female of all flesh went in as God commanded him. And and who, Noah shut the door. No, wait. I'm sorry, hold on. And the Lord shut him in. Richard Sebes, a Puritan theologian, states, God's act of shutting Noah and his family in the ark signifies his protective care and sovereign grace for his people. For his people. 
And this is the beauty of what Christ has done for us. It keeps, it reminds me of Psalms 29 verses 10 and 11. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people and may the Lord bless his people with peace. Noah and his family may have fallen in the ark. They may have stumbled as the ark shifted back and forth. They may have stumbled in the ark, but they did not fall to the depths of judgment. They were held safe in the ark of God's safety. God's kingship and sovereignty was all over that ark during the midst of the chaos. And let me tell you that the ark of Christ is our safety. And we may stumble and we may fall, but we will not fall to judgment. You may stumble, but you will get back up by the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus will continue to draw you to himself and mold you and shape you into the image of himself. When you repent of your sins and you trust in the goodness of King Jesus' work on the cross, you are held and protected for all of eternity. You're given strength to be able to walk in a world around you that has immense struggles and immorality and chaos. And you may struggle and you may stumble, but you will never fall so far that Christ can't pull you back up. The Lord keeps you protected and gives you peace that surpasses all understanding. And some of us have been through that. Some of us may be even going through that right this very moment. And that's the hope for you and I in this day. That's the hope for you and I in this moment. Is that Christ has called you into Him. Called you into His ark. He is the ark. And that door is sealed by the Holy Spirit. According to Ephesians chapter 1. That door of the ark of safety in Christ is sealed by the Holy Spirit and you will not fall to judgment. And listen, that is only for those that are in Christ. But not everybody is a child of God. Everyone is a creation of God. Listen, there was a lot of creations of God during the flood. Only his kids were safe. Only his kids were safe. The calling for you this morning is, are you a child of God or a creation? If you're a creation, judgment's coming. But if you're a child, oh my goodness. Take heart. The king is coming. Our father, our heavenly father is coming. And he is going to judge this world. And then he's going to set it up. And we get to reign and rule with him. We just sang about it. We get to rule and reign with him. I can't wait. The kingdom is going to be amazing. So this is this is the time for you to, you know, as I you know, Noah stood outside the door. Listen, judgment's coming. Get into the ark of safety. It's going to be safe in there. It's done. Ew, gross. It looks dark in there. You got animals in there? Ooh, is that a cow? Ooh, I might fall. I might stumble. I don't. You mean I got to sit in a damp, ugly, nasty boat with you? Yeah. I don't want to. Okay. Well, enjoy judgment. Could you imagine what happened the day the ark shut and judgment fell? I guarantee there were men and women pleading, banging on the outside of the. Let us in! Let us in, Noah! I can't, I didn't shut the door. I didn't shut the door. It wasn't me. The king shut the door. And when the king shuts the door, it's shut. Right now the door is wide open. The door is open. Come, repent, trust in the ark of Christ. See Him for what He is. Trust in His finished work and you will be safe. That's the calling for us today. Father, thank You for the day. Thank You for Your Word. And Father, if there is one man, one boy, one girl here today,
who does not know you. Father, I pray that they would come to know you, that they would repent of their sins, and that they would trust you with their life today. God, help us. We need you. In Jesus' name.